The regret was almost immediate. I finally got what I wanted, and it was a disaster. For weeks, I had been hanging out at a friend's house, playing on his brand new Nintendo 64. Super Smash Brothers, Pokemon Stadium, these were our favorites. And we'd spend hours each day playing those video games, and gosh, we just loved it. We could not get enough. We had so much fun. But it didn't take long before I wanted to have my own Nintendo. I wasn't content to just go to my buddy's house a couple streets over and play. No, that wasn't good enough anymore. I wanted to play at home too. I begged my parents to buy me my own N64, but the console alone was over $100. Then you had to buy the games, and those weren't cheap either. So the more I begged, the more irritated they became. And eventually the answer of we'll see became a hard no, which then quickly became don't ask us again. This left me with only one option. I would have to pay for it myself. I had saved up just enough money from helping my dad mow the lawn at home and at an office complex that my grandparents owned. But at $5 a week, It took a lot of time in the sun and behind that stupid lawnmower to save up that kind of money. But somehow I had managed to save over $100. And and my want, my desire for that Nintendo was so strong, I didn't even stop to think about how much work and sweat I had put into it to get that kind of money. There was no cost-benefit analysis in this head. No thoughts of future wants and needs. Nope, I just wanted it right now. I wanted it right now. So I convinced my parents to take me to the bank where I promptly emptied nearly all of my savings account before going down to the game store. There I picked up my brand new toy along with a few games that my brother and I could play together and we we had it home. I couldn't wait to set it up and start playing. But that's when the regret kicked in. Within just a couple of hours of playing that game, I realized the fun I was having was not really worth the pile of money that I had set on fire to get it. All those hours in the sun pushing that mower, and for what? For this? For some for games? For video games? I felt so dumb. Then to just absolutely pour salt in that open wound, I took the whole thing, games and all, back to the store hoping to get my money back. But you know what they gave me? In-store credit. In-store credit. The money was gone forever. I had wasted it. I definitely did not get what I wanted. I had wasted on something I did not need. And when I finally did get what I wanted, I hated it. It was a disaster. The Israelites, though, in Samuel's day, faced a a similar situation, but on a much grander scale. You see, they faced a problem, the Philistines. And the Israelites only wanted one thing. They wanted to win. They wanted to crush the Philistines and drive them into the sea. Now, just a crash course in ancient history for you, the Philistines were a small band, or small nation, I should say, a small nation of advanced, organized, and aggressive people. The Egyptians said the Philistines were part of the Sea People, that's what they called them, the Sea People, that had immigrated to the southeastern Mediterranean around 1200 B.C. This means the Philistines were a constant thorn in the side of Israel during the conquest of Canaan, And this continued well into the reign of King David. Remember David taking on the giant Goliath with just a sling and a stone? Y'all know that story from VBS? Goliath was a Philistine. But well before the time of David, Israel was at war with the Philistines again. 1 Samuel chapter 4 tells us the Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel And as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 of them 
on the battlefield. This, this is a humiliating defeat, isn't it? The people of God aren't supposed to lose, especially not to these pagans who stood in the way of their occupying the promised land, the land that God had so long ago promised to give to their ancestors, Abraham and Sarah. So why did God let them lose? That's the question the Israelite leaders asked too. The elders wanted to know why God didn't give them the victory. Why had God not helped them in their time of need? That's his job, isn't it? In the covenant God made with Israel, God is the suzerain. He is the strong king who is supposed to provide protection for his vassal client, Israel. At first, it seems like God had not upheld his end of the covenant. But rather than asking the Lord what had happened, rather than discerning his will and listening to his voice through things like prayer and fasting and prophecy, the Israelites came up with their own explanation. They lost the battle, they said, because God wasn't with them. They had neglected to bring the Ark of the Covenant with them, to bring it into battle with them, which means God hadn't been there to fight for them. Duh! How could they have been so dumb? They missed it. After all, the the Ark is the footstool of God. He is enthroned above the cherubim. So we forgot to bring the Lord with us. How silly. We should go to Shiloh and make sure we bring him down to the battle with us. So the Israelites hatched this scheme to unleash their secret weapon on the Philistines. Methodist scholar Dr. David Watson calls it Operation Ark Bomb. Operation Ark Bomb. Let us bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh so that, they, so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. Did you catch how they phrased it though? Let us bring the ark so that God may go with us and save us. This seems like a great idea, foolproof even, right? Wrong, this is bad, this is really bad. They are trying to twist God's arm into helping them, into letting them do what they want. They want to manipulate the Lord of heaven and earth. 1 Samuel tells us the people sent men to Shiloh and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty who is enthroned between the cherubim. And among those who were there and involved in this plan were none other than Hophni and Phinehas, the wicked sons of Eli. And when I say wicked, I do mean wicked. The writer of 1 Samuel never says a kind thing about these two brothers. Apparently, these two men, while serving as priests under their father Eli, took the best parts of the meat from the sacrifices for themselves. They wanted the ribeyes. They wanted the fillets. And they left God with everything left. They treated the offerings to God with contempt. And they slept with the women who served at the entrance at the tent of meeting. For them, God was a means to an end. So knowing that these two guys are involved already shows that this is the wrong move. Things are about to go from bad to worse. Up until this point, though, everyone thinks this this plan is going to work. This tactic was going to work. Operation Ark Bomb couldn't fail. This is why when the ark entered the Israelite camp, the Israelites shouted so so loudly that the ground actually shook miles away at the Philistine camp. This obviously worried the Philistines as they wondered what new weapon or new trick the Israelites had waiting for them. But scripture tells us that once the Philistines realized that it was the ark of the covenant that they had brought into the camp, they were terrified. Gods have come into the camp, they said. Nothing like this has ever happened before. We are doomed. Who will deliver us from the hands of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Now, the Philistines' theology may have been wrong. They thought the Israelites worshipped multiple gods. 
But still, they rightly understood the gravity of the situation. Unlike the Israelites, in that moment, the Philistines feared the power of God that had been unleashed on the Egyptians through the plagues. They remembered how God had split the Red Sea in half, and they knew that they didn't stand a chance against the unbridled power of the Lord. But rather than run away, the Philistines marched forward and engaged in battle against the Israelites. And as you're reading the story, if you're anything like me, you expect something like the scene at a Raiders of the Lost Ark. You expect these Philistines, like the Nazis, to get wiped out in a flash of heavenly wrath and glory where their faces melt off and everything. Right? That's what you expect. You assume that God is going to show up and unleash the full might of his wrath on these Philistines. But did you catch what happened when we read through it? Did you catch what happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. God didn't do a thing. Operation Ark Bomb was a complete dud. So the Philistines fought. And the Israelites were defeated and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. The Israelites didn't get what they wanted. They didn't get the win, and they didn't get to drive their enemies into the sea. Instead, they were slaughtered by the thousands. And to add insult to injury, the ark was captured and taken off into enemy territory. Meanwhile, the old priest Eli is waiting for news of the battle. Eli, the leader of Israel, the priest, the prophet, was blind. And there's a whole sermon there that the chief seer and discerner of God's will for Israel is blind. You get what the scriptures are saying here. But even though he's blind, he can hear. He can hear the uproar as that soldier, that Benjaminite, comes into the town of Shiloh. This soldier has torn his clothes and has put dust on his head. Two signs of mourning in that culture. And the people of Shiloh knew what this meant. And the sound of their anger and grief reached Eli before the soldier did. Israel has fled before the Philistines, and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of, the, of God has been captured. After hearing that last bit of news, Eli fell backwards and broke his neck. Israel not only lost the battle, not only lost thousands of lives, not only lost the ark, but they lost the man who had been leading them for 40 years. So this worked out poorly. See, in fear and desperation, the Israelites hatched a plan to use God to accomplish their ends. They must, they must have really believed that God had agreed with them because we're talking about the Philistines here. Why wouldn't God want to destroy the Philistines, right? So it makes sense that the Israelites thought, well, let's just roll God in here. Let him unleash some fire and brimstone, and then we'll call it a good day, right? But here's the deal. God cannot and will not ever be used in this way. God is not a weapon. God is not a tool we can pull out whenever we want. He is not a vending machine. God is not a genie. His goal is not to serve you and me, to give us whatever we want, to let us do whatever we want to keep us happy. God doesn't work that way. God is not a means to an end. God is the end. He is the goal. God does not appear on our command, even if we pray fervently, even if we pray in front of the Ark of the Covenant itself. God is sovereign. He responds to our prayers, but he is not beholden to our will. I need to be honest here today because there is a temptation in our world, just like in Israel's world, to use God like an instrument. I think about us Aggies always praying for a football game 
God, if you'll just give us this win, we'll go back to church tomorrow. Or this week, God, if you would just smite that baseball coach, we'll finally be happy again. If you know, you know. But it's way more than just sports. That's a trivial example. Think about it in terms of God talk. God talk can be a way of getting clicks, votes, money, or power. God talk can add gravity to our claims about right and wrong, just and unjust. It can serve an unrighteous agenda. God can be a word that we use when we want to sound like serious people. And in many cases, God is nothing more than a cover for a grift. Pay particular attention to how God is used by politicians and pundits, especially as we approach an election. The same can be said for businesses that try to use their faith to drum up business. Ask yourself, what do they mean by God? Whose God? Our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the living God, the God revealed to be three in one, one in three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the God who gave himself up on the cross so that we might live, the God who loves us unconditionally, the God who told us, take up our cross and follow him, the God who told us to go sell all your possessions and give them to the poor and come follow me, the God who said, love your neighbor as yourself. Is that the God they're talking about? Is that the God they're talking about? Or the God they're talking about, an idol made in their own image? A distortion of all that is true. Pay attention to their fruit and the answers will become extremely clear. Because the truth is, just like as 1 Samuel shows us, when we try to use God It won't end well. Notice that God didn't actively punish the Israelites for their sins in this case. He didn't wipe them out with a series of plagues or toss lightning bolts down from heaven. He simply left them to their own plans. Think about this in terms of Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way which seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. Sometimes the greatest discipline God can inflict on us is to withdraw his spirit. That's what Romans 1 teaches us too. Paul writes that God gave up the Gentiles to immorality because they refused to acknowledge him as God. And since I did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind and to things that should not be done. Towards the end of our scripture reading this morning, We learn that Phineas' wife was pregnant at the time of his death. And when she learned that her husband and her father-in-law, Eli, were both dead, she went into labor and gave birth. She named the child Ichabod, which means without glory, because the glory of the Lord had departed from Israel. Dr. Watson writes that this relates directly to God's warning to the church in Ephesus in Revelation. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. If God removes your lampstand, you are no longer a church, even if you have the form of one. You have become Ichabod. You have become without God's glory. In fact, any faith community can become Ichabod. We follow the wrong leaders when we insist on our own way, when we choose self-will over self-denial and follow our sinful hearts rather than God's divine guidance in Scripture, God may finally give us exactly what we want. And it certainly be nothing less than a total disaster. C.S. Lewis picked up on this in his book, The Great Divorce. He wrote, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. God may abandon us to do our own will, which will only lead to our complete destruction. This is what happened in Israel. Operation Ark Bomb didn't work. The Israelites tried 
to use God rather than to seek his will and discern his path. Anything like that always leads to ruin. Trust me, it does every single time when a politician talks about God and family values nonstop but never follows that talk up with any action, what happens? Without fail, we find out he's been having an affair for 10 years. How many times has that happened? Or when a preacher uses God to expand his brand and become a celebrity and we find out he's been stealing from the church all along. Or a business that plasters a cross or in God we trust over all their, bi- all their websites and all their cars and all their trucks. But we soon discover they've been gouging people for years. Or when any of us, you and me, make plans on our own without consulting God and just ask him to bless it after we've already gotten started. But before too long, the whole thing comes crashing down all because we finally got what we wanted. So before we act, self-examination, repentance, and discernment are essential. We have got to turn from our ways to God's ways, seek his will, and follow in obedience. And here's the hard truth in all of this. I fear, I honest to God fear, that a large segment of the American church has become Ichabod. God has removed their lampstands. Too often we haven't sought God in repentance and obedience, but have tried to use God to get what we want. We've tried to use God to build our own kingdoms, our own brands. The results have been consistently predictable and disastrous. But the good news is that nothing is ever wasted on God. Nothing is ever wasted on the Lord. I believe he is using this moment to purify his church, including us, to purify us and to call us back to holiness of heart and life. I saw that at annual conference last weekend. I got to watch both clergy and lay people raise their voices in praise and their hands in surrender. People were being prayed over left and right. They had pastors who feel like they're facing a dry time in their ministry to stand up and let us lay hands on them. Repentance was happening. Revival was happening. Lives were being rededicated and God was at work at annual conference, people. At a business meeting, worship broke out and revival happened. The glory may have departed from some parts of the church, but not forever. God will restore in his own time and in his own way, and I believe he is beginning the work of restoration right now. My time at annual conference, I believe, is a testament to that. God is bringing about a new revival, and all we can do is continue to pray, Lord, revive us again. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.